yes madam please okay. Okay. good evening all respected dr devkulkari madam dr joseph monterio sir dr gorak rakde and dr vikas tarne no program is successful without good faculties and good moderators on behalf of maharashtra state chapter isa मनीषा सॉरी यू आर म्यूटेड सॉरी टू इंटरअप वर्षा मैडम वर्षा मैडम अनम्यूट बोलना करू ना यस 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 मैम आई स्टार्ट अगेन सॉरी गुड इवनिंग एवरी मैम रिस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर देवपुजारी मैडम डॉक्टर जोसेफ सर डॉक्टर गोरख रोकड़े एंड डॉक्टर विकास करने no program is successful without good faculties and good moderators on behalf of maharashtra state chapter isa i am extremely thankful to all you to all of you for accepting our invitation and showing eagerness in participating in this event arranged by maharashtra state chapter isa both the topics are really interesting art of waking up a neurosurgical patient yes we do want early recovery of a neurosurgical patient and early extubation is desirable for early clinical monitoring so let us hear from both of our speakers about the about the uh, gorak will speak on early recovery from neuroanesthesia and we all discuss about various comorbidities like diabetes hypertension asthma but we do not discuss so much about a patient who had sustained previous stroke and then comes for non neurological surgery so we have dr vikas karne from pune to speak on this very important topic uh, may i request dr anita to introduce dr dev pujari madam yes thank you manisha madam i am very happy and uh, privileged to introduce dr rajeshri dev pujari madam and uh, madam is a at present a senior consultant anesthesiologist at jaslok hospital mumbai and she has more than 30 years of experience in neuroanesthesia her areas areas of interest are neuroanesthesia neurocritical care and patient <coughs> care and uh, her uh, she is at present a vice president of the indian society of neuroanesthesia and critical care she was a gc member of isa maharashtra in 2018 and uh, she was the organizing secretary of the national conference in neuroanesthesia and critical care and she has organized many cmes for jaslok hospital and presented many papers in state and national conferences and she has edited a book on neuroanesthesia she has also got a distinguished award from the national board of examination as the distinguished teacher and with this very short introduction i present to you dr mrs dev pujari welcome madam thank you uh, thank you thank you anita uh, yes madam you want to speak something some no i, I just uh, apologize for giving you a cv template which is a year old oh. uh, actually this year i was made the president of isla Indian Society of Neuro Anesthesia, and would also like to say that uh, since a couple of years, we have started uh, the uh, PDF program, doctoral fellowship program in Jaslok, and uh, because uh, we have increased our strength of surgeries and we got clearance and uh, did a good job. By uh, the second year, my fellow stood first in India. so thank you i just thought i would like you thank you anita thank you very much thank you very much madam and i'm very sorry for that no no it's my problem uh, i yes, gave a old thing that you uh, because cv said vice president so i was uh, heartiest congratulations to you madam congratulations madam thank you thank you madam thank you uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce today's moderator dr joseph montero sir sir is 
transcendental neuroanesthesiologist and program director doctorate of national board examination neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care program sir is scientific research committee member and affiliated to pd hinduja hospital and medical research center mumbai sir is uh, md and uh, done fellowship in neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care at edinburgh hospital cambridge uk sir is interested in neuroanesthesia neurocritical care airway management training research and publication he is awarded and got scholarship from jn tata endowment induja cambridge trust scholarship jansis ji tata gift scholarship cambridge society bombay and ratan tata tribal fellowship welcome sir thank you for those introduction and i am very happy to be a part of this and the importance of uh, spreading the word and the knowledge way throughout the state is more important because most of the conferences are located to the main metropolitan cities and uh, speakers from other parts don't get an opportunity to share their experience so i'm happy the topics are a little practical too so they will help to share their own skills and at the same time spread the good word thank you okay thank you sir our uh, today's uh, speaker dr gorak rokde it i am happy to introduce dr gorak uh, he is my friend and he done his uh, mbbs from dr v m medical college and md uh, da from uh, gmc mirrors he he is working since last 17 years in solapur and uh, in neuroanesthesia since last 13 years he done two, more than 200 cases of retrograde intubation and percutaneous tracheostomy he presented research papers at various state national and international conference welcome dr gorak and i request you to start your presentation thank you sir thank you avinash sir uh good evening uh, everyone uh, i am feeling very glad or very lucky to be on this platform for presenting whatever i have done or i have learned from uh, my teachers and from our speakers uh, i thank uh, i am very happy to be on the same uh, platform with dr dev pujari ma'am and dr joseph sir and dr manisha ma'am for giving me the courage to present something uh, in uh, this on this platform uh, on neuroanesthesia uh, i am literally speaking i am very small guy we present here as a presenter but uh, i will dare somehow to present what i have experienced and what i have learned thank you once again to all uh, my topic is early recovery from neuroanesthesia गुड और स्मूथ इमर्जन इन लाइफ एवरी वन इज एन आर्टिस्ट वी लर्न फ्रॉम अवर टीचर्स एंड देर इज नो लिमिट for the teachers that is uh, like i can learn from nurses i can learn from my junior colleague my senior colleagues my teachers uh, and 
various CME, CME speakers, national, international speakers. After learning from these people, we try to add some new ideas in it. Then practice in our day-to-day -day practice. Again, repeat with new learnings. Finally, an individual gets his or her own style or protocol of the defined procedure. I am still a learner and too many years to go to become an expert. And definitely I want to increase my knowledge. <clears throat> For general anesthesia to be a smooth one or good one, main three key factors are there we have to uh, consider. First is pre-op evaluation and plan of anesthesia, intraoperative management, and early postoperative recovery. Considering or coming to the neuroanesthesia part, the aims are there should be optimum operating conditions. As a brain is very smooth, delicate, and complex structure, Surgeon, when he wants to operate, he has to be very good field and a happy environment. So in that, there has to be stable hemodynamics. We have to maintain the stable intracranial pressure. We have to minimize the CMRO2 to decrease the oxygen requirement to the brain. Then, most important is early detection and prompt management of interrupt complications, if any occurs. Controlled but rapid emergence to enable early assessment. And monitoring of neurological status. Uh, coming to the pre-op evaluation, uh, confirm the diagnosis, indication, and cons consent. In the diagnosis, we should know the type of surgery, the extent of surgery, the chances of uh, bleeding, uh, whether uh, excessive or minimal bleeding, the, if uh, tumor is there, if it is superficial or deeply seated, and type of surgery that emergency or elective considering the time to resuscitate the patient or optimize the patient. Routine pre-op assessment of uh, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, airway has to be done uh, neatly. Then any co uh, comorbid medical condition is there like diabetes, liver failure, kidney failure, or the part of treatment for that and medications uh, used for that, we have to look after to modify the uh, drugs used to uh, for anesthesia to prevent the complications. And investigations appropriate for age, general status of patient and type of surgery. We should assess level of consciousness, presence, and extent of uh, neurological deficit. Observe the respiratory efforts. Uh, this is uh, important for uh, deciding whether we should uh, electively ventilate the patient postoperatively or uh, wait for uh, extubation or emergence. And clinical manifestations of raised ICP. We have to assess the blue, uh, fluid status, that is dehydration. If there is any dehydration, we have to correct it. Electrolyte imbalance, glycemic status, rule out endocrine dysfunction, especially in pituitary tumors. Review CT or MRI scans. Then identify the patient who may require post-op ventilation. 
Immediate pre-op evaluation again is uh, important. Reassess the neurological status of the patient. Make sure patients' routine medications are served on time. Attach the monitors, that is routine pulse, NIBP, SPOP, CG, DCOP. Especially for neuroanesthesia, CVP, arterial line, and BIS are uh, more helpful. Small dose of uh, benzodiazepine, that is midazolam, is better to be given prior to induction or in the pre-op room to avoid the stress or anxiety of the patient. Uh, most of the books say avoid opioid premedications. Insert RT in cases of bulbar palsy. Coming to the induction, the pre-oxygen, pre-oxygenation is must here. And induction with fentanyl, propofol, or thiopentone, lignocaine or esmolol can be used to blunt the intubation response. And uh, books also says scoline or sucol or sexamethanin uh, is avoided because it causes a transient increase in ICP. Very important is attempt of laryngoscopy has to be done only when patient is adequately paralyzed. And maintain head up. Uh, this comes in position. Avoid extreme neck flexion or rotation of neck. Give additional dose of fentanyl or skull block or local infiltration before fixing the pins of uh, Mayfield clamp or Sugita clamp. In the maintenance of uh, anesthesia, we can use TIVA, uh, that is propofol, or inhalational techniques, ISO or CO. In inhalational technique, CO is preferred. Propofol is most commonly used drug for the maintenance because it provides a titrable sedation and it gives rapid smooth recovery. Neuromuscular uh, blocking agents has to be administered by either by continuous infusion or intermittent boluses. It is important that short acting agents are used to allow their uh, rapid recovery at the end of the surgery. Analgesia maintained with intermittent boluses of fentanyl or remifentanyl. Nitrous oxide is avoided. Maintain PaO2 more than 100 millimeter of mercury and PaCO2 between 30 to 35 millimeter of mercury. Avoid hypocarbia as it causes uh, vasoconstriction and it can damage uh, the physiology. Or it, it can hamper the physiology of already damaged brain. In case of intracranial hypertension, if necessary, uh, administer mannitol or Lasix. In fluid management, dextrose, dextrose is avoided. Uh, normal saline, that is 0.9% is preferred. Blood loss may be torrential. So uh, ideally, we should preserve blood products, that is PCV and FFP. Intraoperative use of Goal-directed fluid therapy has proved and associated with decreased morbidity and lesser hospital stay. Permissive hypothermia with reversal to normothermia before patient awakens. Uh, then we, we have to use uh, this intermittent compression stockings for thromboembolic prophylaxis. Uh, coming to the emergence, emergence means to move away or out from something. So here patient comes, or patient wants to be away from anesthesia. And uh, an awake patient following neurosurgery is the best neuromonitor. Early awakening, early detection and intervention for the post-operative neurology complication can influence the outcome of the patient. The present study and existing 
literature support the fact that all the commonly used anesthetics in neurosurgical patients have reasonable and acceptable recovery. Uh, here, <clears throat> I want to stress the point, it is not what we use, but it is how you use that is more important. So uh, I can remember, uh, even everyone can remember that in the era of ether and halothane and pavlon, uh, we are having so many good teachers or seniors, colleagues with us. They have practiced very nicely. Their patient has used to, uh, used to awake just after finishing of surgery. So how we use or how we practice is more important than what we use. Uh, in the extubation, coming to the extubation, traditional technique uh, that is carried out after return of spontaneous ventilation, pharyngeal suction and revision and return of laryngeal reflexes. It's reversal of neuromuscular blockage prior to return of consciousness. We should think, think in terms of reversal first or response first in neurosurgical patients, depending on the nature of the surgery or the intraoperative course, how it has uh, gone. Response first, that is the patient's ability to respond following uh, cessation of anesthesia may actually represent reversal of both unconsciousness and the neuromuscular blockade. Therefore, reversal of residual neuromuscular blockade at this stage can lead to fast tech extubation with, uh, without coughing and uh, limited sympathetic stimulation. Reversal first, here we reverse the patient before he or she awakens. Itself, it decreases coughing and hemodynamic fluctuations. Uh, what are the key points of good quality of emergence? That is early awakening. Surgeons are always happy if patient is uh, responding earlier. Limitation of hemodynamic changes. Minimization of coughing. A reasonable level of alertness. And we should avoid the hesitation during the phase of emergence. That is we should decide whether this patient has to extubate or not to extubate earlier. And considering uh, the patient which are not fit for early emergence or uh, immediate emergence inside the OT, that uh, depends on patient's pre-op neurological status, evidence of raised ICP, intraof events, uh, that is duration of and complexity of surgery, blood loss, any complications or hypotension or anything uh, which makes uh, the patient hemodynamically unstable. Uh, nerves, that is neurosurgery errors. This is a concept, is a recent concept implicating errors in craniotomy, which is in a developing phase. I don't know exactly. Now, coming to the, my experience, surgeries we do are in trauma, extradural, subdural hematomas, contusion, in vascular surgeries, aneurysms, AVMs, AV malformations, hypertensive bleeds, tumors, uh, different type of tumors, C pangal tumors then supratentorial, infratentorial, and superficial tip tumors, deep-seated tumors, transnasal pituitary uh, tumor excision, cranioplasty. I think this is the most commonly done surgery, cranioplasty. Spine, almost all type of uh, spine surgery we do, we perform here uh, without kyphoscoliosis and orthopedic trauma. Now, uh, 
uh, I want to uh, simply put here how I do. Actually, that was the main topic. Uh, approximately the adult of 60 kg. Uh, so how I practice today. In pre-medication, glycopyrrolate 0.1 milligram, fentanyl 100 microgram, omes 20 milligram, dexa, lignocaine uh, before intubation 60 milligram, levipil uh, as a prophylactically anticonvulsant, uh, injection tranexamic acid 1 gram. Uh, almost Almost 100% patient, uh, I pre -curorize. And I am very happy with squalene after Becuron or Atracurum as a pre -curorize. And in the induction, again, thiopentan uh, I use. I am very happy with that. 250 milligram and succinamethanine, 100 milligram. And uh, very gentle laryngoscopy and smooth intubation. In the maintenance of anesthesia, I use oxygen, nitrous, CO fluorine, propofol, and vacuronium or atracurium, depending on the patient's comorbid conditions. In the maintenance, uh, in first half, I use more of CO fluorine. In second half, I use more of propofol. That is 2% to 0.2 or 0%. And uh, propofol, I use, I start with 10 and maximum up to 25 ml per hour, I use. In between, top of analgesia uh, with nalbufin or fentanyl. 50 mic fentanyl or 5 plus 5 nalvifin. Uh, the most uh, liked part of anesthesia, that is analgesia, is local anesthesia by me. I use maximum local anesthetic drugs at maximum possible sites, like pins and uh, surgical site. Even for cranioplasty, uh, myself give local. Uh, before uh, painting and draping, or before painting and draping done by surgeon. Dextromid I use in boluses of 10 microgram, usually two to three boluses in between. And it is, uh, I don't use more than 50 micrograms over uh, the period of whole surgery. Uh, again, I prefer betalock in uh, small doses of one, mil one milligram or small doses of NTG infusion to decrease the blood pressure or to optimize the surgical uh, field. Uh, in monitoring, uh, we have only pulse ox, SpO2, ECG, ETCO2, NIBP. And Urine output, IV fluids, or blood products. I usually check repeatedly for urine output. For uh, IV fluid uh, to be managed. Uh, I use plastic drips to maintain euthermia. Uh, one incidence was there. There was some a blanket. Uh, warmer blanket uh, that one patient had accidental burns uh, is my experience. So I have stopped using uh, any type of warmer and I am really happy with only plastic drips covered everywhere the body. Central line also I use it rarely. Just I take two IV lines of 18 gauge or 118 or 16 gauge. All prefer 16 gauge too, but I use 18 or 16. Uh, extubation is routine after uh, respiratory attempts with 
reversal of myoperlate. If patient is having some uh, airway obstruction, I put airway with xylokinzil. And the most importantly, uh, I do is vigilantly monitor the patient for 30 minutes inside the OT. So, uh, what I would like to suggest or wh what my experience is continuous monitoring and immediate action at the predicted or unpredicted uh, event is the only thing needed to avoid the complications. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gorak, for sharing your experience. I would like our expert moderators to add a comment on this. We'll discuss all the questions at the end of both the lectures. Madam, the yeah. 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 So, okay. thank you. Uh, uh, Joseph, you'd like to talk yeah, first? Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gorak, for that excellent presentation. And uh, we're very happy to see you, as you said, on this platform sharing your experiences and it, it appears you have done a lot of work. So now I would just like to add a couple of points and if anybody has any other comments to me. So I think one of the most important parts of this emergence is monitoring. So I suggest the, the better way to monitor your patients is to use a depth of anesthesia monitor. So it gives you a working number. So now whether you use whichever monitor is available to you, so whether it's BIS or any other monitors available to, it gives you a working number and not only you, even your surgeons can see the depth of anesthesia. Very often when you want to deepen the pain, sometimes we end up giving a very high dose of anesthesia, which is not being monitored and that may lead to hemodynamic complications. The scalp nerve block, the use of the scalp nerve block cannot be underestimated. You can use it preoperatively. If you are not comfortable after the pinning, you can use it. So that decreases the amount of anesthesia you can use. And uh, that is an extremely good way of maintaining the right depth of anesthesia without resorting to volatile anesthetics or even the use of propofol. So that's one important point. I also like to administer, rather than a long-acting beta blocker, esmolol as an infusion because it is short-acting. So what happens is the effect may revert in about nine minutes. So rather than using a little long-acting, once you have injected it, it's gone into circulation for one and a half hour. And another very important step I feel for the emergency is train of four monitoring. Invest in a train of four monitor is a simple monitor. So then this question of residual paralysis and even your reversal is done extremely scientifically and rationally. So I make it a habit and all my students learn, use it for every patient. Don't wait for that one very special patient with some neurological syndrome or some Gyan Bari and on that day you start searching for it. So this is my one other take home message which I want to give you. Uh, and another thing, important thing is see very often as anesthetists we are always little on the defensive. But remember the emergence can be delayed in two ways. One is the neuroanesthesia sort of complication. So don't think that every patient who gets up late is because of you. Because I can see you're already doing a very good job. There is a thing called neurosurgical trespass. The surgeon may have done something which he may not share with you. So it's better to be on the board. I watch the surgeon and the monitor continuously. And if anything has happened intraoperatively, a good rapport with the surgeon is the best way for the patient to emerge well. So he can tell you this is uncomplicated, straightforward. You have a good rapport. And he himself may say, you know, this patient, because of this, I think we should electively ventilate overnight and all that. And after some time, you reach a state where you decide, okay, this patient, I should not go for a reversal. I'll sort of electively ventilate this patient. So these are three, four points I'm bringing out at this stage. I hope I made my points clear. You yeah. mentioned about ERAS. So yeah. ERAS is a thing that is in a, it's come in a big, becoming in a big way. But we just conducted a questionnaire study, which will be published soon. But there are not many takers for it in India. Yet, people are still working on it. But the key thing is here to optimize the patient preoperatively, to reduce the fasting time, to build up the patient calor calorically uh, in the pre-op phase and stuff like that. Okay, but uh, we are taking baby steps forward, even in India. 
it is not widely accepted yet okay with that i will hand over to manisha uh, can i come in please yeah may i come in yeah so uh thank you rokri first of all uh, i would just like to say that this is a brilliant topic which you have chosen manisha and this should be discussed more often because this leads to whether you have done a good job or not and most centers have different protocols um your center may have a very different protocol from what we are doing in other centers or tertiary centers so and as the topic suggests the art of making these patient wake up makes or break uh, properly will make or break your surgery so even if a very good surgery is done and if the emergence is bad and if you have not taken care of the emergence a uh, routine surgery can go haywire and you can have intra post operative complications so before that i would just like to say as for you specially that most of the times the first thing happens is are you going to wake up this patient or not and it all depends on how the patient is systemically and how the patient is cerebral what is happening to the brain and that is what joseph explained so systemic you can do your five h's is the patient warm enough not hypothermic not hypotensive not hypotensive uh, tensive not hypovolemic what is the hematocrit if you, there's a lot of blood loss and you have not made it up if it's the hematocrit is less wait for some time give uh, uh, i mean bring the hematocrit up or think about elective ventilation then he, also the osmolality if the osmolality is low please do not extubate this patient and as uh, uh, joseph has said or manisha has emphasized please keep a residual neuromonitor uh, see that there is no residual neuromonitoring block and you as you are using vecuronium i would advise you to change to cisatrocurium or atrocurium they are better drugs for these people and try and learn to do uh, intubation with atrocurium itself avoid succinethonium okay so these are some things which i thought i should tell you as far as cerebral uh, uh, concerns are there so see if the patient has a preoperative altered status okay then take take your time and ask the surgeon and then another thing which is happening is you have to be very careful if there are any intraoperative uh, uh, events or if you are doing neuro monitoring and something has happened take your time electively ventilate this patient see that the surgery if the surgery is long lasting the patient is hypothermic try and electively ventilate the patient if there has been intraoperative brain swelling also see that you do not extubate this patient fast and basically you spoke very well about the response first or the reversal first now reversal first nobody does it nowadays because reversal first if you reverse the patient and you try to extubate deep there are chances of aspiration and you miss out many things a neurological examination cannot be done well so you do a response first properly okay you gradually get the patient to wake up and if there is a response you it automatically means that your reversal uh, can be done fast and you can fast track and take this patient out and with the response you can really get a fast idea whether this patient is going to uh, wake up fast without any neurological complication or uh, uh, you know deficits and you can extubate that patient so the third thing which i think you should uh, read up in general anesthesia is called as no touch technique so when you are extubating the patient or when you are waiting i think there is a thing called as masterly inactivity do not rush for a uh, suction do not stimulate the patient too much do not rush to put off your propofol and do not rush to take a little time uh, a little time with the patient is well spent many uh, many surgeons also you know rush you into uh, moving the head rush you into getting the patient out quickly do not get uh, you know Uh, do not get intimidated by them take your time do a slow emergence as we we have said and also the other thing which you can do is you can use a libitolol or esmolol Lib libitolol i find is 
a good uh, thing as well all while to avoid the hypertensive response. Scalp block definitely works wonders. We have all changed our uh, uh, practice and as soon as the patient is intubated, we put in a scalp block to avoid post-operative pain and uh, emergence problems. Sorry, I have taken a little long to tell you about these things, but these were just practical points which has helped us. And uh, in the audience, there will be many many accomplished uh, neuroanesthetists and they must be having their own points so we can discuss that later when it comes to question answers thank you manisha thank you so thank much you. madam thank you for all those great tips definitely we are going to have a very interesting interactive discussion because there are many questions in the chat yeah. box thank you gorak for uh, sharing your experience let us start with this next topic. We have Dr. Vikas Karane with us for the second topic. Dr. Vikas Karane is a senior consultant and head of the department at Sayadri Speciality Hospital, Pune. He was governing council of Maharashtra State Chapter ISA from 2016 to 18 and then from 2018 to 20. He was treasurer of Society of Anesthesiologists of Pune from 2019 and 20. He is winner of prestigious COPS Best Paper Award in Neuroanesthesia at ISACON 2014 at Madurai. He, was, he has presented paper in World Congress of Anesthesiologists at Hong Kong. He is a postgraduate teacher and guide in Anesthesia National Board Examinations. He has presented various papers in international, national and state conferences and uh, invited as a faculty at various conferences. He has published papers in international and national journals. I would definitely, uh, we all are interested to listen to what Dr. Vikas has to say. How do you see that the neurosurgical, uh, a patient with previous stroke coming for a non-neurosurgical case? Dr. Vikas, please. Thank you, Madam, for a kind, information, kind introduction. So good evening, everyone. It's a, it's an honor to be here in front of you all with all the seniors in uh, neuroanesthesia across Maharashtra. And uh, I really thank uh, Maharashtra State ISA uh, to give me this opportunity to be uh, a speaker in front of you all. Today, I'm going to talk about anesthesia for non-neurological surgeries in patients with previous stroke. The stroke is classically characterized as neurodeficit because of an acute focal injury to CNS by a vascular cause, either it is related to infarct or it is related to the hemorrhage. And 80% of the stroke, as we all know, is ischemic in origin. So across the globe, it is the second most co common cause of the mortality after coronary artery disease, and it is commonest cause of chronic adult disability with almost 50% of those who survive the first stroke uh, will have some or other residual neurological disabilities. However, there has been a steady decline uh, across the Western countries in past 30 years, which can be uh, directly related to increased awareness about cerebrovascular accidents, ease of accessibility to thrombolytic therapy, stroke-ready hospitals, and probably control of risk factors. That's a debatable point. So what are the common risk factors for the stroke? It is uh, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, smoking, and obesity. Coming to stroke uh, in India, the incidence is much higher than Western countries. Uh, in one of the paper which was published in 2016, says that in India, in 2001 and 3, the death, the 19% death occurred because of the cardiovascular disease, including stroke, which is estimated to rise to 36% by 2030. So it simply says that there is a significant disease load in our society and this much higher incidence in India can be attributed to uh, inadequately controlled risk factors because of uh, limited access to the healthcare in the rural part of the India. Public awareness regarded to regards to stroke is very poor 
and only a small number of ischemic stroke patients get the benefit of thrombolytic therapy which is because of the cost or delayed admissions so these patients who have had stroke at any point may come for either neurological surgery cardiac surgery or vascular surgery or other surgeries so we are going to exclude the neurological surgery but one of the commonest surgery that is performed in these patients is coronary uh, carotid endarterectomy however we are not going to go into the depth of uh, carotid endarterectomy because it itself is a huge topic so we will stick to non neurological surgeries along with carotid endarterectomy along with peripheral vascular procedures <coughs> orthopedic procedures which includes most of the trauma around the hip general surgery urology onco surgery and cataract so coming to stroke and anesthesia the anesthesia challenge in these cases is to uh, is the secondary stroke in perioperative period so effects of anesthesia and surgery itself make these patients with history of previous stroke prone for perioperative complications with occurrence of secondary stroke in perioperative period which is 6 to 12 times higher as compared to the general population which may aggravate the neurological disability in perioperative period so definition of perioperative stroke which is going to be our challenge which we want to avoid is any embolic thrombotic or hemorrhagic event with motor sensory or cognitive dysfunction lasting at least 24 hours occurring either intraoperatively or within 30 days after surgery so patients who are undergoing non cardiac non neurological surgery 0.1 to 1% overall there is incidence of perioperative stroke and in non cardiac non major vascular surgery it is higher it is 2 to 3% now we need to understand here is cardiac surgery itself is a high risk factor uh, for uh, perioperative stroke uh, including patients who require on pump uh, cardiac procedures in that case the incidence is comparatively less as compared to the incidence that we see in a non cardiac non major vascular surgery so coming to uh, incidence of perioperative stroke in non carotid major vascular surgery which was published in uh, which is part of the 2021 uh, recommendations in circulation journal it is only up to 15% of the stroke which happens on uh, post operative day 1 and another 50% occur between post operative day 2 and 8 while in non cardiac non vascular surgery the incidence of stroke in first 24 hours is almost 50% and in first 72 hours is 93% so the incidence itself is high and the incidence in early post operative period is also high in non cardiac non vascular surgery the factors which contribute to the stroke in non cardiac non vascular surgery are distinctive uh, distinct from other surgery and they appear to be temporarily related to intraoperative and immediate post operative period so in cardiac surgery we have direct risk factors which includes uh, cardiac or arterial manipulation requirement of cp bypass uh, delayed complications of cardiac surgery including atrial fibrillation myocardial infarct however in non cardiac non vascular surgery the cause of the stroke in perioperative period is unclear so wh why what may be the reason that the perioperative stroke happens in these procedures so a putative mechanism in these cases could be intraoperative or perioperative hypotension or low flow state previously undisclosed large artery stenosis carotid stenosis anemia associated tissue hypoxia in perioperative period thromboembolic episodes and enhanced coagulability coagulability or thrombosis in the setting of systemic inflammation endothelial dysfunction and recent stoppage of antithrombotic medication so what is anesthesia goal goal is to avoid secondary stroke in perioperative period so what are anesthesia concerns we need to know the nature of surgery whether it is elective or emergency and if it is elective what should be the timing of the surgery what is the degree of neurological disability at this point what are associated comorbidities and what are ongoing medications which may include antihypertensives beta blockers statins antiplatelet or anticoagulant as a prophylaxis for secondary stroke and few patient may be on antiepileptic anti therapy coming to the nature of the surgery we need to assess the urgency of the proposed surgery what is the magnitude invasiveness and what are the anticipated hemodynamic 
uh, repercussions during the procedure. This will define what anesthesia we can plan for this particular patient. Whatever surgery is planned, if we could decide whether we can go for a minim minimally invasive procedure, that could be better. However, that all depends on the patient status. Whatever said and done, the shorter the duration of surgery and anesthesia, lesser is the complication, which has been uh, documented in the literature. So we have a patient who is posted for an elective surgery. How much we should wait? So let's see the data. This is from uh, JAMA Journal in 2014, where we see around close to 5 lakh patients who belong to no previous stroke category, where the incidence of perioperative stroke is 0.078%. However, those who have had stroke previously, those who are operated in less than 3 months, incidence is almost close to 12%. Those who are operated between 3 to 6 months after the stroke, the incidence of perioperative stroke is 4.5%. Those who are operated between 6 to 12 months, the incidence is only 1.7%. And those who are operated a year after the previous stroke, the incidence is 1.42%. We need to understand that the odds ratio in the last category is only 8.17. So, any major adverse cardiovascular or cerebrovascular event or 30-day mortality or ischemic stroke, the risk of all these factors are very high in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery within first 12 months after the prior stroke. Evidence between surgical timing and stroke is limited. However, we can definitely say looking at this data that the elective non-cardiac surgery should be deferred possibly for 9 months, at least for 6 months in those patients who can gain significant improvement in the quality of life with elective surgery. However, those patients who undergo emergency surgery, non-cardiac surgery, specifically within first three months of the prior stroke, the incidence of perioperative stroke is 20-fold high. So immediately after an acute ischemic stroke, what happens is there is an impaired cerebral autoregulation which lasts from one month to three months and impaired vasometer reactivity for first three months. So these are the two contributing factors when they're combined with any emergency or elective surgery within the first three months of previous stroke. Even minor changes in the blood pressure can affect cerebral perfusion significantly and this makes our patients more prone for ischemia and can end up into secondary stroke. Now coming to the degree of neurological disability, so we, what we need to understand, what was the extent of neurological dysfunction that was there at the time of the stroke, primary stroke and what is the recovery? If the recovery is close to 100%, we can imagine that there has been significant improvement in the blood supply to most of the areas where the initial insult had happened. Uh, however, every patient may not be uh, lucky enough to reach that stage and there will be patients who will have either motor deficit or there can be memory or emotional uh, behavioral changes. So all those parameters needs to be assessed and documented. Uh, we should go through previous carotid Doppler or MRI reports if they are available for our <laughs> understanding what was the origin of the uh, stroke and what kind of impact it had. Now coming to the comorbidities. Most common associated comorbidity is ischemic heart disease with or without prior myocardial infarct. So it may have systolic dysfunction and may have uh, atrial dysfunction. So these patients will have highest risk of perioperative stroke. Along with that, patient may be diabetic, patient may have hypertension, chronic renal insufficiency and uh, COPD. These patients are also uh, have, may have dyslipidemia. So when, whatever is the... Uh, Whatever is the comorbidity present, uh, all possible attempts should be done to optimize that particular morbidity so that perioperative risk can be minimized. These patients who have had major neurological uh, disability following the previous stroke, so they may be chronically uh, debilated and they may be prone for pulmonary aspiration. So we have to rule out that there is no aspiration, there is no associated aspiration pneumonitis. They may be prone for deep venous thrombosis because of the immobility and there can be nutritional electrolyte imbalances which needs to be assessed and corrected. These patients as we discussed uh, already that they may be on, on 
some medications which includes anti hypertensive uh, few may be on uh, beta blockers so anti hypertensive and beta blockers should be continued and if it is uncontrolled hypertension either the doses should be stepped up or additional uh, medicines can be considered to control the blood pressure these patients may be on statin if not and if there is a dyslipidemia if statin is started 2 weeks prior to surgery it reduces the incidence of perioperative cardiac events and stroke whereas perioperative withdrawal of statin if the patient is already on it is in associated with increased risk of stroke these patients may be on antiplatelet as per aha stroke prevention guidelines uh, either aspirin alone or in combination with the clopidogrel is recommended for 21 to 90 days as per the 2021 uh, recommendations so these patients will be on uh, aspirin so if it's a uh, if the surgery planned has a low risk of bleeding in perioperative period aspirin can safely be continued as a uh, protective agent uh, in perioperative period however if there is a uh, surgery which is planned um, has a high risk of bleeding for example intracranial surgeries or middle ear surgeries or spine surgeries or trp then we'll have to hold aspirin or clopidogrel or any other antiplatelet which is going on and during these 7 days we have to make sure that a bridging therapy is introduced same is applicable to those patients who are on anticoagulants for example patients who has got atrial fibrillation will be on anticoagulant so that needs to be bridged with use of either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin uh, to reduce the risk of thrombosis at the same time uh, withdrawing them in pre operative period so that the intra operative bleeding can be controlled so now coming to anesthesia planning it all starts with noting down the, the date when the stroke had happened what was the type of stroke whether it was ischemic or hemorrhagic and what is the residual deficit from that particular stroke previous stroke related investigation needs to be reviewed if available and secondary prevention medication that we have just discussed needs to be reviewed and continued or withdrawn accordingly so investigations will remain same uh, that we usually prefer for any other surgery depending on the profile of the surgery however what we need additionally is to uh, is to look at the coagulation profile we need a fresh ecg echocardiography uh ct mri ct angiography or mri is not routinely indicated unless patient has got a significant deficit or patient has got a very high risk for perioperative stroke intraoperative monitoring standard monitoring uh, ecg pulse oximetry capnography and blood pressure monitoring along with that if the patient condition is critical or if the surgery is complex or it is an emergency surgery invasive blood pressure monitoring central venous line for the drug administration and urine output should be considered coming to intraoperative neuro monitoring in terms of cerebral electrophysiological monitoring transcranial doppler or cerebral oximetry it is not routinely recommended and should be reserved only for those patients who are at high risk for repeat stroke as we all know that cerebral perfusion correlates better with the cardiac output and cardiac index rather than having attempts to measure the cerebral perfusion uh, we can have cardiac output based management in these patients goal directed management based on the cardiac output which can optimize the perioperative hemodynamics and reduce the risk of perioperative ischemia to the brain now coming to anesthesia options we can have basket of anesthesia techniques which include general anesthesia with or without intubation we can use any of the regional anesthesia including uh, central neuroaxial block and we can also think of using uh, moderate sedation depending on what is the procedure what is the patient profile and urgency of the uh, surgery whatever said and done regional anesthetic techniques may be considered for reducing perioperative stroke risk though the effect is likely to be very small regional anesthesia techniques will definitely add advantage specifically in orthopedic uh, procedures to minimize the risk of perioperative deep vein thrombosis and uh, embolism however other uh, precautions or other prophylactic therapies for the same can be provided if the regional anesthesia is not suitable if you are planning regional uh, if you are comparing general anesthesia versus regional anesthesia most of the studies that we see they are based on 
carotid endarterectomy. So in carotid endarterectomy, uh, we have carotid endarterectomy under GA or under uh, regional block with or without sedation. So in earlier reports, it was stated that regional anesthesia has got insignificant advantage over general anesthesia in reducing the perioperative stroke and death. However, recent studies have proven that general anesthesia does not increase the risk of perioperative stroke during carotid endarterectomy. For other types of surgery, there is insufficient evidence. There are few studies which say that general anesthesia is associated with increase in the high incidence of perioperative uh, um, stroke uh, in orthopedic surgery specifically. Uh, however, this does not, the, the particular study does not specify how many patients with prior stroke were considered during this study. If you are planning regional anesthesia, two things will definitely need our attention. One is what is the level of neurodeficit? If our patient is hemiplegic, has had hemiparesis or other uh, dysfunctions or patient has got autonomic dysfunction, then we will have to plan our regional anesthesia accordingly. Similarly, if you are planning uh, central neuroaxial blockade and if the patient is on antiplatelet or anticoagulant and uh, for elective surgery obviously we'll have to use a bridging therapy hold the antiplatelet agents and accordingly take the patient after seven days following the uh, standard guidelines given by ASRA. If we're thinking about general anesthesia in I if, if we compare uh, induction of anesthesia with IV agents and inhalational agents IV agents, we know that it decreases the cerebral metabolism and provides some kind of cerebral protection. And we know that inhalational agents will cause some vasodilatation. It may be beneficial because it improves the blood flow. At the same time, when we are comparing induction of anesthesia, if we are using intermediate or short acting opioids, it reduces the dose of induction agents and may provide better hemodynamic stability. Coming to maintenance of anesthesia, it can be done either with inhalation agents or you are with propofol can also be uh, administered with an ultimate aim for a smooth and rapid emergence for early postoperative neurological assessment as described by uh, Dr. Gorov just now. Nitrous oxide has also been studied uh, during general anesthesia in these patients and there is no evidence of increased risk of stroke in patients undergoing uh, either carotid endectomy or major non-cardiac surgery while nitrous oxide was used. Dexperitomidin and propofol are found to be safe in acute stroke victims who are coming for endovascular procedures or thrombectomies. However, while using it, hemodynamic instability needs to be watched for. Coming to neuromuscular blocking agents, succinylcholine better to be avoided in stroke patients with significant loss of muscle function because there is a risk of life threatening hypokalemia. Non depolarizing neuromuscular agents can safely be used. Intraoperative beta blockers, as we discussed, if the patient is already on beta blockers, it should be continued. However, if there is intraoperative need for controlling the heart rate, intraoperative beta blockers can be used like ismolol or labetalol. However, literature does not suggest a, uh, metaprolol because few studies have shown that it is associated with perioperative stroke. The risk is almost 3.3 fold. Coming to intraoperative management, uh, first will be glycemic management where we have to target for a blood sugar between 130 to 180 uh, milligram per deciliter and the recommendation is against any kind of tight control where we try to control blood sugar below 130 or 120 because these efforts in perioperative period can lead to hypoglycemia and can lead to related adverse events. These particular patients, uh, if there is intraoperative blood loss, the blood transfusion threshold should be kept relatively high as, as we know that normally we can wait till 7.5 gram per deciliter uh, in other patients but in these patients as anemia is one of the contributing factors for perioperative stroke it is better that we keep the threshold at 9 and avoid intraoperative or perioperative anemia this will reduce the perioperative stroke however overzealous blood transfusion should also be uh, should not be done because that itself can increase the viscosity and can may lead to uh, thrombotic events. Respiratory physiology and cerebrovascular reserve. These patients in, in intraoperative period, normocapnia should be maintained. If there is hypocapnia, it will increase the cerebrovascular resistance and will decrease the cerebral blood flow. 
in patients with hypercapnia there will be impaired cerebral blood flow in high risk brain regions via steel phenomena so neither hypo or nor hypercapnia is recommended what we have to use is normocapnia in period of acute period coming to blood pressure management there is no specific threshold which is recommended however we have to have understanding of what is the baseline blood pressure of the patient and a 20% vary not more than 20% variation from the baseline should be allowed in perioperative period so as we discussed uh, in patients who are critical or undergoing major or supra major surgery a goal directed therapy uh, should be used and uh, any event which can cause hypotension or low flow state should be avoided if a beach a patient is being operated in a beach chair for whatever reason the blood pressure should not be measured on the lower limb but should be measured on upper limb non operative upper limb and a consideration should be given to a gradient between uh, brachial artery and the brain which is usually 12 to 24 mm of mercury this may not be always possible so in those cases where it is not possible for the good um, perioperative outcome uh, we may go for perioperative invasive blood pressure monitoring which will give us a more realistic blood pressure reading coming to the supportive measures in perioperative period anti aspiration prophylaxis is must in these patients because uh, they'll have delayed gastric emptying and they they may have impaired protective airway reflexes in those patients who have had moderate to severe uh, stroke uh, normothermia all attempts should be made to maintain the normothermia and any inflammation and infection should be avoided because ultimately that can lead to uh, thrombotic events and can lead to secondary stroke in perioperative period coming to recovery from anesthesia recovery of protective airway reflexes should be ascertained before tracheal extubation and ischemic brain may respond differently to anesthetic so if possible if a patient has had have had major uh, neurological deficit or patient is undergoing major or supra major surgery depth of anesthesia monitoring should be available to understand the response of the brain immediately on uh, uh, short term unilateral delayed return of motor function on the affected site uh, may happen immediately after awakening from anesthesia which is termed as differential awakening therefore on recovery from anesthesia neurological function should be assessed at the earliest so ultimate aim is to have smooth and early recovery from anesthesia if general anesthesia is given if there is any new motor deficits are noted patient should be closely monitored and if this deficit persists radiological testing may be needed so coming to post operative care patient with severe neurological deficit and or after major surgery patient should be monitored in high dependency unit patient will require hemodynamic and neuro monitoring post operative electrolyte imbalance needs to be watched for because it can predispose patient to arrhythmias and uh, shift for shifts in intravascular volume should also be assessed prophylactic measures to prevent deep uh, venous thrombosis should be incorporated at the earliest and if the patient was receiving antiplatelet or anticoagulant pre operatively it should be re restarted as early as possible depending on the surgery performed now in spite of all these efforts a patient may end up into uh, perioperative stroke if that happens the two major concerns that we have or the two major challenges that we may have is first if un until the patient is under anesthesia it will be very difficult to diagnose unless we are using some neuro monitoring in uh, intraoperative period and if once it is diagnosed the treatment modality can be a challenge considering a post operative post surgical status of the patient so whenever we we suspect a patient having um, stroke in perioperative period the stroke immediately be followed neurology should be involved and radiological assessment should be immediately initiated this may require ct brain and with uh, consultation with neurologist we can decide whether we want ct angiography or perfusion study especially in those patients where there are severe stroke symptoms with nih score more than 6 of the cord there are cortical deficit so patient needs to be assessed evaluated and diagnosed and the aim will be to restore the blood flow to the injured brain uh, that is very important so there are two options either patient can have intravenous thrombolysis or there can be mechanical embolectomy now considering the post operative status of the patient uh, though both interventions are 
safe uh, in select patients. Mechanical thrombectomy may be preferred over intravenous thrombolysis because of the risk of the bleeding from the surgical site. So, coming to the end of our discussion, perioperative stroke is a potentially devastating complication. We need to have a strategy to minimize the risk, which includes preoperative assessment and optimization, defining the optimum timing of the surgery in case of elective procedures, selection of anesthesia technique, focusing on perioperative blood pressure and blood sugar control, early blood transfusion, avoidance of anemia, early and smooth recovery for neurological assessment if general anesthesia is given, and rapid recognition of perioperative stroke and early use of intravenous thrombolysis and mechanical embolectomy in appropriate patients. I thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you, Vikas. That was really a wonderful uh, the lecture was really wonderful and your slides were too beautiful, very clear and very comprehensive and there was a clear cut message in all your slides. May I have words of wisdom from our moderator? Madam, please. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, that was well, very well, uh, uh, you know, uh, the messages were very clear cut and very precise. And this is all what you do when you have a patient who is for surgery. However, there was one thing which uh, I would just like you to elaborate a little bit if you can, like uh, a patient with uh, on dual platelet uh, therapy, antiplatelet uh, anti therapy, comes in for an emergency surgery. So what would you like to do about that? Just a little elaboration. What would you do about that? What would you take care? And uh, okay. yeah, that's it. So I think that was, yeah. Yes, because carry on. Hello, Vikas. Vikas, we are able to hear you. Vikas, uh, we are able to hear you, Vikas. Vikas, can you hear us? I think you are muted. Vikas? I think he is not able to... Yeah, so... Yes, uh, Varsha? Uh, Varsha? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, please see uh, what is the problem to Dr. Vikas. Are you Varsha. muted? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Now, now, now we can... Uh, hello, hello, Vikas? Uh, no. Avinash, sir, can you hear uh, me? Sir, up left. Yes, yes, yes. You yes. Can hear okay. you please continue. Yeah. Because, please continue. Because we are able to hear you. Okay. Hmm. Madam has asked you a question. I, just, I couldn't uh, get that. There was some uh, okay. disconnection. So I, have, I just wanted to know, suppose this, uh, you've described everything about how to take care of a perioperative stroke as well as, you know, a patient of stroke going in for other surgeries. But uh, these are, uh, there are patients of stroke who suddenly, you know, before the 90 day limit or whatever you say, suddenly come in for an emergency surgery and they are on uh, dual antiplatelet. So just a few tips about what precautions you will take and you have to do the surgery any which way. So that's all I just wanted you to uh, elaborate on. That's all. Okay. Uh, sir, do it, sir? Yeah, I think uh, uh, to really answer that question, I'll make yeah. a few comments. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, sir, yeah, because you want to answer? Sir, actually, there was another, again, disconnection. I could hear Madam's question. 
only half. Okay. Okay. Can okay. you please? Okay, so the, please uh, uh, Joseph can repeat it at the end. Come on, Joseph. Please. Okay, no, I will just make a few comments. Thank you, Vikas. That was an excellent talk, as Dr. Manisha said. All the slides were very comprehensive and clear. I would like just like to add a couple of points. See, when we speak of goal directed therapy, goal directed therapy, the only monitor most of you all have maybe having maybe a NIBP cuff, which will tell you the mean arterial pressure. Now, what I want to give you a take home message is that one cap doesn't fit all. So, for everybody, the seventy blood pressure or the mean arterial pressure may not be wise. So probably the person who's neurologically intact, who's got no other neurological problem, uh, uh, cerebral perfusion pressure or mean arterial pressure of 60 is fine. But if a person is a hypertensive, chronic hypertensive, then the curve is moved to the right. So in such cases, you may have to keep a higher pressure. So now, though we talk about mean arterial pressure, I keep myself simple targets, which I can share with my colleague who's with me in the operation theater. So basically, I don't allow the systolic blood pressure to go down below 110. And I don't allow the systolic blood pressure to go up above 140. Till the guidelines come and the people are discussing all these numbers, let us make it simple. So now if you aim for 110, it may go down to 105. But if you aim for 190, it may go a little lower. So try to keep it 110 and 140. That is one simple thing I want to give you. If you have got an arterial line, then I prefer to use that pulse pressure variation, which comes through that and arterial PPV. energy. It's free. Yeah. Most monitors now, you get that PPV. So the PPV helps you to give your fluids yeah. because if you don't have a CVP line, you got only an arterial line. Then I try to keep that PPV less than 5, around less than 10, let's say. And that will help you to guide it because sometimes you just look at the blood pressure and you may give fluid. So my suggestion to you sometimes is don't give fluid always to raise the blood pressure. This is the normal reflex. Pressure come more, get through, we'll give some fluid. Or you'll give Bifentine or something there to bring it up. So then my suggestion is in case sometimes it is better to give a vasopressor if the pressure comes down. You're given fluid. You know you have given enough. Your PPV is okay. Then you start a vasopressor. Don't feel bad to start noradrenaline in a peripheral dose. A small dose will help to maintain it. Most drugs better you don't give bolus, you give an infusion. So that is the one or two points I wanted to make. Otherwise, he has covered everything very well. Yeah, and uh, I thank Vikas for that. Yeah, because you, if you can hear now, yes, I thank can. you well, very well done. Okay, very thank very you. precise. Thank Should you. we take the questions? Yeah, yeah. one of the questions is. Uh, yeah. what, what, was Madam's, what was Madam's question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Madam's question is a patient who's on dual platelet therapy. She's asking a patient who's on dual platelet therapy who's coming for surgery. What are the points you will keep in uh, mind? Just a few tips, which tips. You so that you know your whole uh, the surgery uh, has to be done anyway so now how will you proceed this one? your whole uh, presentation becomes complete okay that's yeah. all i think that was a, a point which was uh, missing because uh, i was more focused on having yeah. a comprehensive view and it's a very valid question ma'am uh, i would like to answer it that if your patient is coming for an emergency surgery at any point who is on dual platelet therapy irrespective of uh, uh, nature of the surgery, we have to anticipate that whatever do patient is going to bleed. So we need to support yeah. that patient either with uh, uh, either either form of the platelet uh, uh, segregate uh, in preoperatively and make provisions for blood transfusion because that is something which we will anticipate. Whatever said and done, we are not going to go away from the surgery in these situations. And we have seen many a times that dual platelet patients they do come for Surgery is like you know emergency decompression, and it's it's exactly. a it's a big challenge to handle. The patient is bleeding. A surgeon is unable to control that. We are transfusing blood, giving platelets. It's one of its kind of challenge that we have. But with these uh, routine uh, scenarios where patient is on dual platelets, we are going to face this challenge more often probably. Thank you. So we we'll need platelet and uh, yeah. pack cells. Thank you. So, and no, there's a good question here from Dr. Mayuri, I think. A patient who's undergone, undergoing cranioplasty, how do you proceed? Because there's brain bulge soon after, uh, during this procedure. She said she has experienced this very often, that when she's doing a cranioplasty and there's a brain bulge. So, any of the speakers want to take it? Or oh, I'll just answer that. It is, I think, it is, it is usually, uh, can I answer, sir? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It is, it is usually a 
Kamioplasty is an elective procedure. So we prepare patient well. It is not something which is emergency. And we do not have any restrictions on our uh, anesthesia choice. So when we are dealing with uh, cranioplasty, the same basic principles of neuroanesthesia should be applied, where we try and maintain cerebral blood flow, we try and maintain intracranial pressure, and we try to give the same laxity of the brain that we otherwise give uh, for any other craniotomies. It is very rare scenario where suddenly the brain will bulge during cranioplasty as against the kind of bulge that we see in craniotomies uh, for intracranial procedures. So with a basic, uh, as long as we stick to the basic principle of neuroanesthesia, most of the times I don't think we'll have the problem of uh, brain bulging during craniopalsty. But if it happens, giving head up position, giving diuretics, maybe using hyperventilation for a very brief period might help us in reducing the intracranial volume and maybe surgeon will be more comfortable in uh, putting the bone graft there. And also check that if there add... is any jugular venous obstruction. Check for the, yes. uh, that is very important because when the surgeon rotates the neck and if there is a jugular venous obstruction, then that also can cause rise in ICP and brain damage. Right. I want to add, ma'am, something. Uh, yes. Surgeon usually assess the size of brain is increasing. They sometimes put the brain needle and get the CSF drained and it collapses or it comes to the normal size and then they put yeah. the bone graft. Bone yeah. 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 I hope that answers the question of Dr. Mayuri. Mayuri. I just want to mention here as an offshoot, there's a thing called a sinking flap syndrome. So in decompressive craniotomy sometimes, or when they're putting the, doing a cranioplasty, uh, paradoxically, the contralateral hemispheres herniates and then you may get a patient who's comatose. So there you can see the flap sinking down. It's very rare, but keep it in mind in these cranioplasty cases if it, in case you come across it. Uh, yeah, and there's this one can question. happen post-operative also. Yeah. And probably that is why the reason there are sometimes you feel, you say that uh, you should do a cranioplasty, take your time, but no, not to take the time. This uh, herniation syndrome can happen to a patient who has already recovered. Already so, undergone. Yeah. And you need to do a plasma. And usually if there is a brain bulge right from preoperative period, the surgeon usually advises a therapeutic plumber drainage. Plumber drainage. Yes. Yes. We just did it a few days ago. There's a uh, question. So the next doctor, question. Dr. Jesse, I think she's saying, what is your choice of local anesthesia? So that is for the scalp block, I guess. Yeah. Dr. Gorak yeah. or yeah. Dr. Yes, Vikas. Uh, my... I use masala, uh, that is a mixture of xylocin with adrenaline and 0.5% sensorkin. I take a uh, sterile bowl, 30 ml of xylocin with adrenaline, 20 ml of 0.5% sensorkin or bupivacin and I add 30 to 35 or th 40 ml of NS or uh, distilled water and according to the size or surface area of the patient, I use it for cranioplasty at the abdominal side and even at the surgical incision site. So you don't, I mean, you don't uh, give scalp lock routinely, that's what no. you are mentioning. Okay. No, I give total local field just like at the In incision place. site only. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, because yeah, uh, what uh, Dr. Gorok mentioned is uh, one of the common things which is performed. However, recently there has been a lot of discussion over mixing the local anesthetic because it uh, alters the pH and probably has uh, some effect on uh, the effectiveness of those local anesthetic. So uh, another way of doing it is probably using a half. See, what we need is more of a uh, analgesia. So even half concentration or bupivacaine or xylocaine can work. So if we have enough time in our hand, if the surgeon is go has gone for the round, I may not add xylocaine uh, for the skull block. I'll take my leisure time. I'll use 0.25% sensorkin. So I can have 40 ml in my hand. I may add either uh, dexamethasone to it or may add clonidine, uh, 30 microgram to enhance the duration 
and give block either i can give a, a field block or i can go for a, a nerve specific block uag guided block can also be the now the nowadays so what dr gorok mentioned is also a right thing we have been doing it we all have done it we never saw in, 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 we never had an issue related to the effectiveness of that mixture but uh, at the same time maybe now we can move on to more safer uh, Mm, processes okay. where we can we can avoid mixing so this is another yeah. another alternative to mm -hmm. add this um, adrenaline in the lignocaine itself it yeah. helps to uh, prevent blood loss blood. yes one, one care we have to we have to take is while uh, injecting at mm -hmm. the Aspiration. level of super, uh, superficial temporal artery we have yes. to be very careful so the good points made on all sides i think uh, even i prefer to use i use the uh, chest sensor skin diluted in normal saline and i keep the option of the lignocaine in case the surgeon wants to infiltrate at some time however uh, the point what he said about adrenaline is important so in fact what i do is sometimes i put uh, adrenaline in myself just a drop or a flush of it so that decreases systemic absorption so in case inadvertently you have made a some sort of a injection it will prevent the systemic absorption it will also make the local anesthesia available locally for a longer period of time and, and i want to also mention a few words in favor of ropivacaine it has got a very good safety yeah, profile a lot of good uh, concentrations are available so instead of using all these mixtures you can shift over to ropivacaine also it is a equally good drug with the best safety profile among all yeah. so uh, the next question by dr naresh paliwal is why only 500 microgram dexamethasone <laughs> can it not be used more if required instead of beta blockers or ntg to control uh, blood pressure anyone to uh, to answer either gorak or vikas either of you uh, i yes. have experienced a prolonged sedation after uh, this one dex medidomid so uh, sometimes surgeon have urge to chalo baba patient kab aata hai bahar sir 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 तो दे टू लाइक कहते कुछ तो चिमटा निकालते वो कुछ तो करते आई प्रिफर बीटा लग मोर दैट सो जस्ट टू टेल यू दैट डेक्समेडेटोमिडिन इज अ वेरी वेरी गुड एन सॉर्ट ऑफ अंडर एप्रिशिएटेड बट अ वेरी यूजफुल ड्रग एंड यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू यूज इट टू कंट्रोल द ब्लड प्रेशर बट यू आर गोइंग टू यूज इट एज एन एडजंक एंड यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू यूज much of the experiment to me you have to be uh, never never start a uh, loading dose first of all keep on a, a small dose uh, manage you uh, a dose which is just going to help you uh, to you know reduce other anesthetic agents uh, the other thing is try and keep a watch in the blood uh, bradycardia if the bradycardia becomes pretty just reduce the thing Uh, reduce the dexam infusion and if the pulse uh, bp you have a target as uh, joseph has explained you have a target of this blood pressure and if the blood pressure starts going less than that reduce the dexam it makes not much of a difference you have an inf a infusion pump going and uh, many times when there is real hypertension and when there is tachycardia you have to use beta uh, i mean beta blockers like lebetilol ndg try and use as much as possible but uh, dexam is no replacement for antihypertensives that's what i feel no i take that point uh, and but i th there's a point in what what dr naresh paliwal is saying also yeah. see dexamethasone is a excellent drug so you use it judiciously you stop it one and a half hour before the end of the surgery because dr gorak has said that sometimes the patient may wake up later so if you have to use it for transvenous yeah. pituitary surgeries where i make the patient up. some of my colleagues give it routinely and i also use it once in a way it controls the heart rate it produces the sedation but you must time it you stop it in time stop it one and a half the plasma half life is more than one and a half, is around one and a half hour so you stop it one hour before so and then you will get the benefit of it the patient will wake up very well as he is saying dr narish is saying it will help you to decrease your use of these other drugs And yes, that is speaking, that's what is the. I question. don't like to use nitroglycerin because it causes rise in the ICP. So if you use a drug like, let us say, dexamethasone, which is also neuroprotective, as he's mentioning, you you use uh, 
esmolol or beta blockers or labetalol as dr rajeshree devpuchari singh so these don't have any effect on the cerebral vasculature too much understood so and uh, it doesn't have any sedative effect so prefer to use drugs which will not raise the icp now nitroglycerin is a cerebral vesicular vein or dilator it will raise the icp here i would like exactly. to just ask something to dr uh, joseph sir sir if you have started who speaking my sir dr manisha oh, yes. manisha yes yeah yeah <laughs> if, if you are using pentanil for the yeah. surgical intervention so do you like to add dexlorotubidine again or continue with topper doses of fentanyl if needed if no, no. emergency yeah. is needed and if you are yeah. monitoring with this also yes, yes i have colox monitor so i go on adding top of fentanyl and rather than adding dexlorotubidine correct no no i go with you i don't use dexlorotubidine that much but if I, since they some of them want to use it but i also prefer to use fentanyl uh as a top up this see once again it is a timing the intraoperative phase is relatively pain free so the, a good dose of fentanyl at the beginning and a good dose of uh, or a half a dose of fentanyl towards the end makes a good sense so that you time the fentanyl also <laughs> very well so we, we don't have remi fentanyl so we not talk about it so i'm saying use your drug well yeah. that so, will so make a big difference so can i can i just uh, tell you two thing manisha fentanyl is perfect use fentanyl but i can tell you Vouch for the dexmedicine that you use a low dose of dexmedicine by itself. You may be scared right now, but try it in patients whom you don't want, uh, you don't expect a lot of problems, and you will see that dexam also reduces the amount of fentanyl you are going to use. It reduces that as well, and it gives you a good. As uh, Joseph has said, it is uh, like uh, in place of NTG or labetalol. Yes, that is true. But NTG labetalol also, uh, I mean NTG, I would not really recommend at all. But labetalol or beta beta blocker, beta blockers have their own use. And just in case you are worried about Dexam, see the minute the pulse rate starts dropping below seventy, shut it off. And as you get experienced and as you get more used to it, you will understand. Because let us see what Dexam is all about. What is it all about? It is a central anxiolytic. so it's going to help in each way wherever and they found uh, uh, that it also gives a little um, it also helps in reducing your pain uh, requirement pain killer requirement for topically not probably in neurosurgery but in any other surgery you will get these uh, evidences so don't get afraid of uh, dexam use it judiciously and i can tell you you will be uh, not uh, disappointed uh, there's a question from a uh, good question from dr vandana mangal what are your considerations for central neural axis block in patients who have under have injured brains like a small edh treated conservatively with no midline shift no mass effect or a recently operated edh posterior for lower limb surgery what is your take in this case of central neural axis block anyone can i answer sir Yes, yes. So uh, it all depends on the neurological status uh, of the patient. Uh, we are dealing with a patient, probably as my, my, the question says, that patient has had uh, recent EDH, either operated uh, can I, or. Can I, can I, Doctor Vandana Mangal? Can I clarify yes. my question, please? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So, so we very frequently. I'm working in a trauma center, so we very frequently get patients who have uh, cerebral. contusions maybe of the frontal so they are a little um, not so all alert but then they are not uh, absolutely uh, bad neurologically either and the surgeons want to manage them conservatively so we have a challenge with these patients that should we or should we not give them they have contusions and all possible cerebral disorder issues so we are worried whether we should be giving central neurexial blocks to these patients or not so th this is a very uh, common scenario even in our day to day practice yeah. we face this situ situation so what we follow is we usually have uh, consultation with our uh, neuro team and the primary focus of the discussion is to identify what is the uh, status of the intracranial dynamics if the contusion or if the edh is very small Uh, which is being managed conservatively 
uh, that does not have any significant neurological deficit and it does not have any evidence of uh, moderate to severe uh, increase in the intracranial pressure. There is no midline shift. So in those cases, we can definitely give uh, spinal anesthesia. See, ultimately, we are worried about uh, uh, the intracranial pressure and lumbar puncture and uh, uh, related uh, herniation. So as long as the intracranial dynamics are within acceptable limits, we can definitely do that. Another perspective in the same situation is, as you rightly mentioned, that patient is either completely alert, neurologically active, nor patient is completely dull. So in these cases, we are always worried about how the brain will respond to the general anesthetic that we are going to use. Because if there is any chance of prolonged recovery and if patient goes on a ventilator for any chance, the ultimate outcome will be affected. So ultimately, what we have to do is we have to do the um, risk-benefit analysis. If my patient is neurologically moderately affected, but intracranial dynamics are acceptable, I think we still have a good chance of doing lumbar puncture and giving spinal anesthesia. Very well. Thank you very so much. Very 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 uh, can I add one more thing, please? One more question yes. to yes. this. So I wanted to understand. So in these cases, our concern is only the intracranial dynamics of pressure. And nothing else is going to bother us or the patient. So Dr. Vandana, let me answer this now. Yeah. So basically, as Dr. Vikas has said, he's given us some points. So check the Glasgow Coma scale, see the neurological status. You can now see there's no way of seeing the ICP unless you're going to check papillary edema. I'll give you a simple answer. One month after CT scan, if the patient is stable, give the spinal. That is the answer I give. Understood? Because now you want to know an answer. Surgeon wants to know an answer. Just because he's got a head injury for life, you cannot say that, you know, he's got a head injury. So one month after CT scan, patient is stable, you can give it. If you're not feeling too good to give it, then you can choose to give a general anesthesia. You must be comfortable with whatever you're giving. Don't get bullied into giving it. Understood? Still, after one month, if you are not happy, because if something happens, they should not blame you that, why did you give the spinal? Okay. So, because the, each patient is different, there's no formula which we can give you, but this is a rough guideline I give. So, that's a, our neural surgeons also think like this. So, once uh, the patient is stable and one month has passed and the CT scan is okay, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much. But I would like to just uh, uh, add to something what Dr. Vandana Madam has said. Like she has, like we are discussing after one month, but it's okay if a patient of trauma has come with a fractured femur and there's a small subdural hematoma or small extradural hematoma on the CT scan. And if the surgeon, the neurosurgeon gives the green signal that no neurosurgical intervention is needed now and the orthopedic surgeon can proceed, then in that situation, I think this is a tricky situation. In that situation, what should be, whether central neurological blockage should be given because there are references that That's if true. a patient has intracranial bleed, maybe a small amount, a subdural or a small contusion, then it is always better to avoid central neurological blockage or even, even an epidural also because even that small amount of drug that we are going to inject epidurally can cause rise in ICP. So if the patient is coming for surgical intervention, maybe orthopedic surgical intervention in the with recent head injury and with evidence of uh, extradural hematoma, even if his uh, Glasgow coma scale is 15 by 15, then also one needs to individualize the case before uh, subjecting the patient to central neurological blockage. Okay. So, I, I, I completely agree with you, uh, Patrika, madam. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, if there is a, enough uh, time has been left between the injury and uh, surgery to be performed, and if the patient is neurologically stable, as uh, Montedio sir has rightly said, that we can give. But in acute stages, there is always a concern. So in that case, if you are worried about rise in ICP and uh, related issues, we can think of giving general anesthesia, but we can supplement it with a good regional anesthesia technique. For example, if I have to do a fracture femur, I may opt for, for only analgesia, I can opt for femoral nerve block, or may, maybe I can go for a lumbar plexus or lumbosacral plexus block, and then give a general anesthesia just to keep my patient sedated if required. So that can also be a better alternative that, that we can think about nowadays. Yes, true. And as, as Dr. Manisha very clearly said, some people think that epidural is a safer option. 
but the epidural if you inject 5 to 10 ml that pushes the dural sac and pushes the csf up and that causes a rise in the icp so don't think that is a little more of a benign option okay <coughs> so regional anesthesia is really advancing we should take um, uh, you know be expert in uh, regional blocks and that could be a, a, a alternative to your uh, neuroaxial blocks dr shilpa has said that the surgeon sometimes blames intraoperative dexmen and ntg as a cause <laughs> of post op hypotension how far is this true this is the question Oh. <laughs> anyone to answer it or uh, you know uh, joseph and i always uh, at logger heads about uh, no, no, see. but <laughs> i Now, just depend which drug is being used here dexmen i told you if you stop it one hour before it cannot be the cause and nit nitroglycerin is a short acting drug you are titrating the dose if you have stopped it also the effect will have gone so is not a question of a blame game i think the best thing you could do is have a excellent rapport, rapport with a surgeon So once you all are on the same page for many years, hopefully such discussions don't come up. <laughs> Understood, na? And Very you must also yeah. see a friendly way of going about it is always what I teach my juniors: the art of communication, the having a good rapport. These things are mentioned; they are not taught in the medical colleges. So I always say, don't take an attitude of confrontation. Usne aisa bola, maine aisa kiya aisa. So then that that matter will get escalated. So Absolutely. better than that, you give a scientific evidence, and you speak nicely and sort out the matter. Usually, not the cause, I would say, but yeah. you would develop it's a good never, rapport with the surgeon. The yeah. yeah. And uh, what are the common surgical? Doctor Shilpa is saying, what are the common causes of post-operative deterioration in craniotomy or in spine surgery? She is asking, what are the common com com uh, complications? Common surgical causes of post-operative deterioration. So I will just say pneumocephalus is a very common cause. It could be some, as I mentioned earlier, neurosurgical trespass. Maybe the surgeon has done something which he has not shared with you, and there can be pneumocephalus. So the, the easiest thing is if you know you keep a time for your emergence. If the patient has not emerged, then you can do a CT scan and find out what is the cause, rather than you know delving into all these things. So you are sure that the anesthesia part has passed off. So maybe half an hour later, still the patient is not waking up. Shift the patient to CT scan. Do a CT scan and see. Correct. Yeah, Any other means? Hematoma at the operated site. That also can be a reason. Most usually, uh, can I? Yes, yes. Add? Yes. yes Most usually, if there is a, a bilateral trauma because of counter cup injury, we do EDH on one side, operate on one side, and after extubation, patient deteriorates. If we do CT scan immediately, we find HDH on more uh, one more EDH on uh, uh, the opposite, opposite side. side. That may that is one of the reasons. Hmm. Yeah, actually, there are many reasons if you go to see, and you have to be, uh, and that is what is the beauty about doing neuroanesthesia because right from before you get a compromised patient and how the patient has undergone. Surgery intraoperatively. There are many things which happen which you cannot see. There are sometimes some, uh, you know, bleeders which could be just uh, supplying arteries, small arteries which are supplying vital organs, and the surgeon never tells you about. And the patient comes out with the. Uh, you know. So don't ever, don't ever get scared. Do your thing properly. Do it exactly as uh, it is advised by seniors, and don't. Uh, blame yourself for deterioration after the <laughs> craniotomy. It could be many things. So if you start doing this, and as uh, Joseph has emphasized, have a good rapport with your surgeon. Know what you are dealing with. Know the surgery which you are doing, and also intraoperatively be very careful. Any major uh, cardiovascular changes or anything, keep the surgeon informed. and that will help you to be become a better person later on uh, i think this is too much of uh, uh, pontificating uh, can you can go ahead with the discussion but uh, believe me if you have a good rapport and if you keep your mind open and if you learn, read the surgery what is is being done you uh, half the battle is won you will be a good anesthetist 
Yes. So, uh, any more questions in the chat box? Yes. Actually, there is nitrous absolutely contraindicated. Uh, if there is a pneumo encephalus. Yes. 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 If you allow, can I make a comment or two? Hey, Come in. Yes, hey, ma'am. Yes, madam. Uh, just one comment about uh, that uh, head injury question that was asked and. Uh, and we had discussed last time also. But one point I wanted to make that whenever the patient is has uh, suffered from head injury and then after a few days or few hours or so is going to undergo uh, orthopedic surgery or other surgery, please repeat the coagulation function because the acquired coagulation parameters uh, can get deranged. So even if the on-admission platelet count is normal, before considering any region to block, you must repeat it. So day three to day five are the vulnerable periods. So that needs to be done. And apart from that, everything else has been already discussed and it's fine. Another question, another comment I wanted to make because uh, about the stroke patients, that not only these patients are at higher risk of uh, repeat perioperative stroke, of losing the most recently acquired neurological function. Yes. We need to ask that when, uh, what was the recovery and when was, what was the most recently acquired recovery? Because it is as if like they are, uh, one layer of the recovery has been peeled off after the uh, surgery is done under anesthesia. So we need to understand that, expect that and explain it to the patient that patient may lose their last ability, which they have acquired very recently because their recovery is a really, really long process. And we need to be taking care about all those things. So that's all. Otherwise, excellent discussion. I thank everybody for such a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Himangi. Thank you. Any more questions? Anyone yes. ask? Dr. Dhananjay, are you there? You raise your hand in chat box. Dr. Dhananjay. I think that was my mistake. It was in the beginning of the program. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. I think we have answered your questions very well. So let me thank, let me first thank all of you for participating so actively. It was a pleasure on my part also to participate. And what I liked was the interactive discussion at the end. And very often lectures are given, but uh, when no questions are asked at the end, and these are very practical questions that have come, I was very happy to note all the questions, very practical, down to earth questions of people who are actually working very well in the field. Thank you so much. Just like to add, thank you, everyone. and. Uh... Also congratulate uh, Manisha for thinking of these topics. Usually, you know, we start with posterior posa or uh, supratentorial, but these are the things which go in making us uh, a, a good thing. Uh, yeah. And both the speakers were very good and Vikas especially very clear, very precise presentation. Thank you everyone. Thank you and congratulations Thank you. to Anita and Dr. Heman Sale. Thank you, Avinash. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So uh, we will uh, conclude this uh, session today, Madam Manisha, Madam, with your permission. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vikas and Dr. Gorak, uh, for their excellent uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, I also thank Dr. Dev Pujari, Madam, and uh, Dr. Joseph, sir, uh, for moderating today's session. Uh, and I also th thank to all the IACN who particip actively participated in today's session. Uh, thank you, Varsha, for uh, technical support. We will meet in next month uh, in uh, with another topic and with uh, um, new speakers, Star Wars 
in the field and thank you thank you very much long live isa good night thank good you night. thank you varsha please uh, can i just make a quick comment yes yes avinash yes. sir go ahead go ahead yeah uh, uh manish madam this was a really practical oriented uh, topics uh, that you had selected um, i really enjoyed uh, preparing the whole thing related to stroke because very often uh, even if we are not practicing you anesthesia we face these patients so it was really an honor and the best thing is it was again a good opportunity for me to learn from the seniors and the teachers from whom i have learned so much in last so many years so thank you again thank you everyone same feeling here from me very much thank you to manisha ma'am dev pujari ma'am avinash sir and joseph sir thank you very much thank you all thank you enjoyed everyone. we really enjoyed the discussion was excellent excellent the the topic chosen is because manisha ma madam is routinely daily doing uh, yes. <laughs> that was <only. laughs> top recording <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> samir sir true ha chalu de ana recording matla ata chalu de chan jala chan jala chan mala te vatle nu tumhi bolu shikel gorak mast ganesha madam ne ganesha madam ne daring dili thodi si maine panchar kela very good kaam kar vikas chan विकास तर एकदम आउटस्टैंडिंग थैंक यू तरी एक पड़े पे सपोर्टिंग मगशिवा हो प्रत्येक वे ढकल नहीं लगत नुस्त पार्टी वरती हाथ लड़ मन एवड मे मैडम मैडम तेरा मेरा बयाच वे प्रोत्साहन दिल चल रे चल बोर थोड़स सॉरी सॉरी बोलत नहीं है कारण एक्चुअली मी न्यूरो एनेस्टिशा कर वीस पंचवीस वर्ष न्यूरो प्रैक्टिस कर खूब छान डिस्कशन अतिशय उत्तम डिस्कशन खरच फार छान न्यूरो एनेस्टिशा प्रैक्टिस करता करता अपन एवड गोषी प्रैक्टिस करो वी डू जस्ट ऑप्शिटिक सोडल तो सग्या गोषी प्रैक्टिस होता पीरियड्रिक एनेस्टेशन दिल जो प्रॉब्लम दिखा मल्टीपल कोमोर्बिडिटीज पेशंट पेशंट्स विथ पेस मेकर पेशंट्स विथ मल्टीपल प्रॉब्लेम एक स्ट्रोक हाइबर्डेशन आईएसडी अथमा डायबिटीज सैडम पंतर लक्ष बारा बारह तास पर्जरी के सका सतला चालू के संध्या सतला नर लक्ष कि इकोनॉमिकल थोड़स फारे मैं बयाचा अच्छी बंद के जस न्यूरो आर्थो नी मी पूर्ण बंद है फिर बाकी सग सर्जरी चाल फास्ट सर्जरी संपले टर्नओवर पाजे एक एक तास पूर्वी लगा एक तास दीड तास आता पंद्रह मिनटा हो तो सीजर तो पंद्रह वीस वीसव्या मिनटा तो संपत स नहीं इकोनॉमी वाइज हाँ इमर्जन्सी जाव लगत फलाफ तुम टाइमिंग रह प्रैक्टिस करता ठीक है छान प्रॉब्लम नहीं टाइम गायनेक सोडापासन ना मी वर्ष एक उठलो एवड स गायनेक एवडे छोटे अटैचमेंट आता नहीं मैं आठवड्या एकदा तरी उठा लगा 
नाही पण आता आता तसं पण मला पण नाही मी इतकी काय नाही काय पण आता काय होतं सगळेजण रात्री झोपायच्या आत संपवतात नाही तर सकाळी उठल्यानंतर घेतात सगळ्यांना आता असं फक्त कारण फक्त जे नवीन गायनेकलॉजी करतात नाही हा फक्त जे नवीन गायनेकलॉजी असतात ना त्यांच्याकडे तुम्हाला इमर्जन्सी जायला लागतात आणि ते आता नाही त्याचा मायाबरोबर सगळे सिनियर लोक असल्यामुळे सिनियर सगळे तयार झाले सगळे सगळे बारा दहा वाजताच छान चलो आपला थँक्यू व्हेरी मच आज एकदम वेळेत झालेलं आहे असं व्हायला पाहिजे म्हणजे जास्त टॉपिक नऊला संपलं पाहिजे कधी हो सी एस सासरवाडीला विकास मध्ये स्पेशली सांगायचं म्हणजे विकास आमचा जावई आहे जावई जावई बापू तुझ्या सासरवाडीला ये नंतर मी माझ्या सासरवाडीला येतो तुला घेऊन येतो येताना परत चांगलंय चांगलंय आणि मला आज एकाच मेसेज आला वा वा मॅडम दोघंही माझे बॅचमेट्स आहेत आज यांचं टॉपिक आहे का दोघंही माझे बॅचमेट्स आहेत या बात आहे चलो बाय बाय थँक्यू बाय बाय थँक्यू 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 एंड करा एंड करा